Good morning, friends. It's a, a pleasure to be here again to introduce the Quaker Stewardship Committee report to you. Uh, I realise that perhaps some people don't aren't aware. Quaker Stewardship Committee reports directly to yearly meeting. We don't have to report to anybody else. So that's why we are here today to report to you. I've been asked to speak about privilege and how I'm trying to use my experience of privilege for the benefit of others. I had the great advantage of growing up in a Quaker community where my opinions were not disregarded because I was a child, where it was just as acceptable for me to say I wanted to be a scientist like my father as to say I wanted to be a teacher like my mother, where there was the money and the education and the awareness to allow me the space and the time and the freedom to make choices and take on responsibilities and to move into adulthood, to work, to marriage, to being a parent. And I took it for granted Everybody else had the same advantages. I live in Canterbury, which sounds like a very comfortable place to be. But there is an area in Canterbury where up to 70% of the children are living in poverty. And most of those children attend a particular school. And I became a governor of that school. And I realised that in order to be a governor effectively, I had to find out about the way the lives of the children. And so when I retired, I was able to volunteer a day a week, working with year two, seven year, six and seven year olds, and year six, 10 and 11 year olds. And I worked with them mostly helping small groups with maths and with English. And I realised how profound was my ignorance of the effect of poverty on their experience. Many of them lacked not just the finer things of life, but also basic skills. For example, in number, because nobody counted the steps with them as they went up them as a, a toddler or counted baked beans on their plate and said, if you eat one, how many are going to be left? And they lacked vocabulary because adults didn't have the time and the energy to talk to them. And this, these effects would last, be with them for the rest of their lives. This made me very angry, and this anger propelled me to volunteering with Citizens Advice where I felt that I would be able to engage with the parents, the adults in these, this community, which I have. And I found there a lot of people who felt that they weren't entitled that they were undeserving, that they were unrespected. And I hope that my Quaker listening is able to give them the value that they deserve and not the value that they felt that they came in expecting. So, to Quaker Stewardship Committee. Move, it, move me further away, right? Okay, is that better? Thank you. As it's early in the morning, I thought we might just wake up our brains a bit with a short quiz. <laughs> don't worry, it's very simple, it's very brief, and you don't have to write anything down. So, here goes. First question, which of the following are important to you? Integrity, openness, sustainability, 
caring for the spiritual and physical well-being of people in contact with, our, with your meeting? Quaker business method. Second question. Do we care about these things because A, we're called to do them by God, B, they're core parts of our Quaker way of life, C, they're laid down in Quaker faith and practice, or D, we'd be breaking charity law or health and safety legislation or data protection principles, or we might be sued for damages. Third question, as we serve our meetings, is doing these things a joy and a privilege or an unnecessary burden that stops us doing things that matter? I'm sure you've guessed that I'm trying to remind you that the stewardship of our meetings and their resources springs from our spiritual beliefs and that we do the work aware of the call to be patterns and, and examples. Early friends succeeded in business and in running the society in no small part because they were law-abiding and of the highest integrity. And so Quaker Stewardship Committee is working in 2019 to strengthen understanding of the spiritual basis of the work of trustees and treasurers. On Friday, we tried to put out a form at the Central Work Fair asking you how this is in our, your local meeting and area meeting. I think one or two people filled one in, but we were stuck in a corner. If you didn't fill in the form, but would like to send us comments about how this work, how, how the spiritual basis of the work of stewardship is seen in your meeting. We'd delight, be delighted to receive them and you can email them to Helen Griffith, Helen G at quaker.org.uk. I had a useful in conversation recently with an area meeting clerk to trustees who said, you tell me that Quaker Stewardship Committee is supportive and advisory. Does it have some authority? Is it a body we must take note of if there is a policy or that, that we are advised to take note of because what it's saying is best practice or that we may take notice of if we agree with it, but not otherwise? <laughs> well, our responsibilities are set out in Quaker Faith and Practice 1439. They start... A, support treasurers and trustees. B, provide advice and guidance to meetings. C, ensure that education and training are available. D, help to ensure that every part of Britain Yearly Meeting is producing proper financial accounts and property registers. And E, certify the fulfilment of D annually to yearly meeting, which is ostensibly why I'm here today. And there are some other things as well. So we have authority from Quaker Faith and Practice to support, advise and help. And you could see E as a big stick. But the must comes from elsewhere, not from QSC itself. For example, Quaker Faith and Practice 410 L, subparagraph L, lays on area meetings the stewardship of financial resources and says the accounts must be examined by an independent person. And 1410 M tells area meetings to send their accounts to Quaker Stewardship Committee. On the whole, Quaker Stewardship Committee, Quaker Faith and Practice doesn't use must, but it uses a should that's not far away. For example, it says, 1413, meetings should ensure there are appropriate checks and controls over the meeting's funds. Well, I think we really must do that. 
there are other musts that Quaker Stewardship Committee tries to make sure that you're aware of that come from financial statutory regulations, for example, about the format of accounts at different levels of income. QSC passes on these musts to area meetings as guidance. That doesn't stop them being musts, it's just not a QSC must. We also pass on advice on best practice, for example, from the Charity Commission and the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator. And some of that's pretty close to being must as well. We also pass on good ideas from wherever we hear them when we think they'll be helpful. Finally, a recent must that's causing some anxiety relates to our Canterbury commitment to Quakers in Britain becoming a low, maybe now, now zero, carbon community. Meeting for Sufferings has asked QSC to gather material about the work of area meetings on sustainability by requesting that it's included in annual reports. And some people are rather unhappy about that. They're complaining to QSC. It wasn't QSC, it's yearly meeting that said must. But we hope that this will be an opportunity for you to celebrate anything that you have done. And we look forward to reading the 2018 annual report. We do read them, friends which will be the first to contain such information, we hope, as a matter of course, and we'll be producing a summary that will go to Meeting for Sufferings for them to consider. In 2019, Creative Stewardship Committee is trying hard to strike the right balance with our support, advice and guidance, taking into account the amount of work involved in following it, and the severity of the consequences of not following it. This is known as risk appetite. For example, the consequences of not having appropriate checks and balances and controls over the meeting's funds can be devastating. Whereas missing the deadline for sending the area meetings annual reports and accounts to the Charity Commission by a few days is having a date in red on the web page for you, and it's a bit embarrassing. We aim to help trustee, we're aiming to help trustees and treasurers know where to concentrate their limited resources to manage these risks effectively. Finally, our written report states that all registered Quaker charities have submitted their accounts to the Charity Commission or Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator. While this is technically correct, we ought to inform you that there's some confusion about East Cheshire area meeting, which should be registered, but isn't yet. And, but they are working on it, so uh, I'm sure by this time next year there will not be a problem. So I'd just like, finally, to recommend the QSC report to you for approval. Thank you, friends. <laughs>